you're looking at Korah and his rebellion back there in number 16, um, as well as things that led up to it. And all of this is in the context of the open fellowship error that we have been studying. What we are doing today is looking at the accusations that Korah and his crew leveled against the faithful and against the Lord. Today, we're looking at these accusations so that we will be able to see the same accusations are being made in the teachings that uh, the churches have embraced regarding fellowship and how to practice it. So that's what we'll be doing here. I'll be quoting, uh, of course, from the Bible, but also I'll provide for you quotations from Ed Harrell's uh, article called, well, series of articles called The Bounds of Christian Unity. Uh, the reason for quoting from that series is that it became very clearly the de facto manual for the churches in how they practice uh, their uh, fellowship and the things that they do. So I think that it's important to use it and to understand the things that are written there because you will hear them. These are the same arguments pretty much everywhere that you go when it comes to error. So Korah's accusations, I've got four of them basically. There's more than this, of course, but these are the kind of the, the uh, main ideas. The first accusation is you exalt yourselves above the assembly. You think you're better than everybody else, right? Or taking too much on yourself, something to this effect, or you've gone far enough, right? Uh, the second thing they say is you've not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey. So where we are today is not as cool and awesome as you said it was going to be when we became, uh, you know, fellow workers together in this place. Right. The other thing was, you've killed the people of the Lord, is what they said. After Korah and his company had been destroyed by God, by the earth opening up and swallowing them alive, then the rest of the people accused Moses and Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. Which is just not accurate. In any part, no part of that is accurate. <laughs> And then everyone who comes near shall die. That's the other thing they said. Everybody who tries to be right is going to die. We can't please God. That's that. These are the four basics of Korah's rebellion. So the first one, we take these one at a time. You exalt yourselves above the assembly. This is number 16 in verse 3. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said, You've gone too far. All in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? And we have highlighted a couple of things here. First is, all in the congregation are holy, every one of them. This is uh, the idea that, hey, they are fine. The kids are all right. <laughs> they are fine. The problem is you. This is how people argue. And specifically what they mean by this is that there can be priests from every tribe, not just from Levi, not just from Aaron. This is, of course, incorrect, as we looked at in previous lessons. The Lord was very plain that his priesthood had to be of Aaron, and these who came forward to serve as priests with censers did so at the cost of their own lives. Fire from the Lord consumed them. So no... It's not true that everybody can serve as priests. You have to do what God said. And it wasn't Moses who said it, it was God who said it. But the other thing they say, why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? So they think they are in control. They think they are in charge. They think that they are running the place. You know, they are uh, uh, putting themselves higher or better or smarter than everybody else, right? This is the idea. Uh, these things, of course, are false. As we said before, the example or the uh, the scriptures show plainly that Aaron was chosen and there no other tribe was chosen. Uh, 
and no other clan within the tribe was chosen. The scriptures show that God is the one who destroyed Korah and his band, that God rejected those priests that they put forward. So all these assertions are false, right? However, let us look at the first one. All in the congregation are holy. That's what they said. Every one of them, you know, they are all holy. Every one of them. And I would put an asterisk on that and say, except for you, of course. <laughs> Everybody else is acceptable except for you. If you stand for the truth, that we cannot tolerate. That's, you know, we cannot tolerate intolerance is how it goes. And here is the quotation from um, Bounds of Christian Unity. One clear boundary of Christian unity is established in Romans 14. One, him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Whatever the rights of Christians to private conscience, our disagreements cannot be allowed to create an environment that destroys our capacity to work together as Christians. Factiousness is the full-blown fruit of the ignorance and narrowness inherent in doubtful disputations. It is in its own right a cause for the breaking of fellowship. Paul's instruction in Romans 16 17 was directed toward those who troublemakers who cause divisions and strife. It's one of the many warnings in the New Testament against proud, pompous men who seek to elevate themselves by preying on the congregation, the church of the Lord. We can go back over this, and we will. But do you see? It's the same thing. It's exactly what Korah said. Everyone in the congregation is holy, except you, of course, and the Lord is with them. You, Why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? That's exactly what Ed Harrell said. One clear boundary of Christian unity. You know, this whole series of articles is about the fact that the boundaries are not clear. He's spending the whole time talking about how the boundaries are not clear, but there's one thing that's clear, and that is, you had better not stand up for the truth. That's the one thing that they will not let you do. So he goes to doubtful disputations of Romans 14, and this is the key word that he uses, saying you have a right to private conscience. Oh, you can disagree all you want, but... You cannot create an environment that destroys our capacity to work together. You know what that means? You must get along. You cannot make it so that people <laughs> are required to obey. That's what that means. You can hold your personal belief. You can hold your personal error just as long as you don't make trouble about it. You have to agree to disagree. That's what they're saying. It really is what they're saying, too. Oh, the disagreement cannot be allowed to create an environment that destroys the capacity to work together as Christians. This is apparently the most important thing, is to work together. Anything that makes it so we cannot continue to meet together is apparently the wrong. Then he describes the doubtful disputations as factiousness. So now we define the faction. Who is factious? Who is divisive? It's the person with doubtful disputations. And that person is guilty of something that in its own right is a cause for breaking fellowship. Remember, He's writing to defend Homer Haley's error that divorces before baptism don't count. He's defending adultery. So if you come and say, well, Matthew 19 is rather clear about what when you are allowed to divorce and when you are not allowed to divorce, and Matthew 19 applies to everybody descended from Adam and Eve, and John the Baptist lost his head, literally, for teaching the truth about this to a Gentile. 
Well, you are being factious because you won't pipe down and hold that to yourself. That's how they see it. And that, in its own right, is a cause for the breaking of fellowship. This guy who teaches error, no, he can come hold meetings, that's fine. This guy who believes and teaches error, he can stay here because he doesn't insist upon it. But you insist that people must teach the truth about this. Well, that, that insistence is factiousness in their mind. And that is a cause for breaking fellowship. This is why the churches, all the rest of them basically, in this area, are fine with each other. They use one another. They use each other's evangelists all the time. And people move in and out of those congregations freely as they see fit. You got a passport, like the European Union, you know, just fine. But not with South Austin, though. Because you insist on the truth. You insist on the Bible. And so fellowship with you is broken. They have agreed to disagree. Until you agree to disagree, you cannot have fellowship with them. That's the truth. This is what Ed Harrell taught, you see. Those who stand for truth, you notice, are troublemakers. You are the troubler of Israel. They are the proud and the pompous who seek to elevate themselves by preying on the church of the Lord. See, why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly? They're all holy, every one of them. That's all that this is. It's no different. The exact same accusations, you understand? You exalt yourselves, right? The other thing that, had, that, that Ed would write would be this. Continued doctrinal debate is inherent in a biblical hermeneutic that insists upon serious study and literal obedience. No restorer would presume to draft a settled creed, ending all discussion for all time. Don't be presumptuous, you arrogant fool. <laughs> What's that? You think you can know what the truth is and obey it? You're so arrogant. You see, that's what they're saying. You exalt yourselves. He says it's inherent, meaning it's part of the nature a biblical hermeneutic, as in you interpret the Bible insisting upon serious study and literal obedience. Is that what you do? That's what I do. <laughs> it is what I do. Yes, I interpret the Bible with serious study and literal obedience. Of course. What else would we be doing? I mean, I'm not here to waste my time with human think-sos and human traditions. I had plenty of those in Catholicism growing up. If what you want are human things, you know, I, Catholicism has all of them. Anything you want out of humanity, they got it. They have art, literature, music. I mean, all the great painters that you've heard of, all the composers from Bach on down, the literature, the philosophy, the history, the culture, the uh, papyrology, anything you want, they got it, man. You don't need to be joining up with some, you know, silly American religious tradition and going to their devotionals or whatever. This, that's paltry, man. If you want it, go to the Catholic Church. They got everything. But I don't want that, and neither do you. That's why you're here. I want the Bible. I want the truth from God. So yes, I want a biblical hermeneutic. I interpret the Bible in a way that there's literal obedience, yes. But I deny that continued debate is inherent in that. No. That's his assertion. As in, you'll never settle it. It will always be debate. No restorer would presume to draft a settled creed, ending all discussion for all time. So nobody in the restoration movement, anyway, would be so arrogant as to assert that they knew the truth. 
You hear people talk that way today. So that presumption. More than that, there's this, you know, you may have noticed and you may not have noticed this nice little uh, creed word crept in there. That's an accusation too. If you think that you can know the truth and that the truth can be literally obeyed and that we must hold the line for the truth of the Bible, then you are a creedalist. You are a denominationalist. And uh, I still don't understand their arguments. I'm going to be honest with you. I've tried and I've read more of Ed Harrell than, than probably is recommendable. Um, and I've read, you know, uh, well, his name just went away. <laughs> Sorry. The plain talk guy out of burn it. Uh, Robert Turner. Read Robert Turner on creedalism, on creeds and denominationalism. And I honestly, I do not understand what they are saying at all. I couldn't follow it. I'm going to try again until I can get there, but I don't understand. And I am somebody who actually came from a denomination. Uh, but no, we're not making a creed, uh, a human religion, a human denomination. It's nothing of the sort. We're exactly the opposite of this, going back to the scriptures. But noticing, ending all discussion for all time. You know, some people think that the argument is the thing. That, you know, the point of this is that we're, we're all allowed to have our own opinions and to argue about them and that that's what we do when we come here. You know, oh, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to argue, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Now, that's their way of thinking. How about this one? Two slides here. Some fear, says Ed Harold, that an acknowledgement of human fallibility will lead to anarchy and neo-Calvinism. But God has given us rules for living with our human imperfection. Otherwise, we would need an infallible arbiter to settle every dispute. And that idea has already done sufficient damage in Christian history. Interesting. An infallible arbiter. Do we have an infallible arbiter? It's called the Bible. <laughs> yes, we do. It's the Bible. It's not me. I'm not infallible. And I'm no arbiter either. <laughs> Except in the video game sense. But to, we don't need an infallible arbiter. We have one. It's the Bible. But I like this little, this little jab here about if you accept that people cannot understand the Bible, that's what he really means. If you believe people cannot understand the Bible, if that is accepted, then you get anarchy and neo-Calvinism. The fact is that's true. <laughs> if you think that the Bible cannot be understood, yes, of course that's what you get is anarchy and neo-Calvinism. But what I love about this Neo-Calvinism reference here is this is actually uh, the title of a book by Tom Roberts, which is an excellent book. <laughs> Neo-Calvinism in the Churches of Christ. It's an excellent book. Tom's treatment of that is so good. <laughs> and he's completely right. 100% right about it. So I thought that was interesting that Ed saw fit to call him out. Well, he accurately identified somebody who faithfully held to the Bible as his standard of truth. Uh, so that's interesting. But, again, this accusation is you exalt yourselves above the church. You think you are not fallible. You think you are, are perfect. You think that you are the arbiter of every dispute. But no, no, uh, we don't. You don't. That's not what you're saying at all. You're saying the Bible is right. The Bible is right. The Bible can be understood. The Bible should be used. No, I'm not always right. But the Bible is. Uh, all right. So the other accusation, 
another of the accusations, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey. See, there's number 16. Again, Dathan and Abiram were summoned and refused. We will not come up. Is it a small thing you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you must also make yourself a, priest, a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? Will not come up. All right, what are they saying? Well, if you go back over this a bit, they said, you brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey. We're talking about Egypt, right? Does anybody remember Egypt? <laughs> Back breaking, straw brick making, exposing our children to die. You remember that? Is that milk and honey? I don't think it is. So we were happy where we were. That's what that means. Leave us alone. Now you make yourself a prince over us. Well, we've already talked about that one. But this one is the one that we're po focused on in our series, or as we talk about reality, right? You haven't brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey. We're out here in this wilderness, what he means. Will you put out the eyes of these men? What that means is who you're going to believe, me or your eyes, me or your lion eyes, right? It's, look, look around. You can see we're not in a promised land. Everything you said was going to happen when you put, snatched us out of our comfortable place in Egypt did not happen. Look where we are. That's what they're saying. Reality tells us that your assertion, Moses, that you have the revelation of God and that this is the will of God is not true. We can see that it's not true. That's what they're saying, right? You can understand this is what they're getting at. Well, look around. We're not in a promised land. You said we were going to a promised land. Therefore, you are not who you think you are. And you don't have the authority that you think you do. And, you know, it's time for you to stop. Time for you to sit, step down. Well, again, they forgot what Egypt was really like. You took us out of milk and honey, as in we were happy where we were. In the bounds of Christian unity, uh, Ed Harrell wrote from the beginnings of the Restoration Movement, whatever that is, Christians have been of different minds about several persistent and ageless questions of personal morality, such as the scriptural grounds for divorce and remarriage. No big deal. Just fornication, right? It's not really important to God. You think? There's never been a time in restoration history, whatever that is, when there was universal accord on these questions. And therefore what? Who cares? Or on many others of considerable moral and doctrinal importance. While local churches have sometimes divided over such issues, generally speaking, brethren have allowed considerable freedom of conscience in these matters. But not you wicked schismatics who think that you understand Matthew 19. You arrogant fools. <laughs> right? That's what they're saying. You get it, don't you? You see, this is not something that I have uh, made up uh, or misrepresented. It's what he's saying. The Restoration Movement is where he's very comfortable. He's comfortable saying this is an American religious movement. The churches are from America. Uh, you know, my South African brother, <laughs> uh, who'd been preaching the gospel from age 14 until uh, whatever he is now, 50-something. That's one of his favorite ones. He's like, oh, yes, yes, of course it started in America. <laughs> That's why I'm a Christian. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great. Of course, the same guy relishes calling himself an African-American. <laughs> like, no, man, that's, that's not the same thing. But uh, truly, that's the restoration movement. That's what they mean. Well, they're comfortable there. They like that idea. And from the beginning, everybody has had a different mind about 
these questions of personal morality, they're persistent, they're ageless. There's always trouble, there's always debate. There's always been a question about things in the Bible which is not clear at all. For example, scriptural grounds for divorce and remarriage. Does that seem unclear to anybody? I don't think it is. We can talk about it if it is. But no, there's some very clear doctrine about this matter. Jesus was very plain in Matthew 19. But why is he saying this? Because he said, look, everybody has disagreed forever, including about marriage and divorce. There's never been universal accord on this or a lot of other considerable moral and doctrinal problems. The difference is they used to be fine with agreeing to disagree. Now we have brethren among us who are not fine with that, who are demanding that there be unity on the truth of Matthew 19. Right? This is the real problem. See, there was never a chord. There were all kinds of different teachings, and maybe there were. I don't know. I'm no historian. I don't care either. What does the Bible say? But when he points to that, he doesn't say, well, they, they didn't do right. Here's what the Bible says. And they should have known better. He doesn't do that. He says they were fine with allowing, allowing considerable freedom of conscience. You see, the problem is not that they didn't agree. And the problem is not that they agreed to disagree. The problem is you. You won't agree to disagree. And that's why there isn't unity. You understand? This is the thing that he's saying. Will you put out the eyes of these men, right? Who are you going to believe? Look around. Ed Harrell wrote, Our individual fellowship and congregational unity based on total agreement? Historical reality denies such unanimity existed in New Testament congregations or that it exists today. Historical reality. You just got to face reality, man. <laughs> well, do people disagree? Yeah, they do, but... What does that have to do with God? And what does that have to do with the truth? They need to do better. They need to look and be honest and study the scripture. But see, historical reality is truth for this man and for many brethren. Well, just look around. There's no unanimity. But see, this proves too much, I'm afraid. Because you get the same argument from your Baptist friend, your Catholic friend, your atheist friend. Well, if it's so simple, how come there's no agreement in the religious world? Why are there so many religions? I mean, it proves too much, doesn't it? If you're looking at what people do, then yes, it's all messy and complicated. But we're not. We're looking at what did God want? What did God ask for? What does he say in the Bible? And in this, there can be unity. Oh, it sure did come apart, didn't it? It's bad. Let me try to get the lens back into this glass. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> oh, it's... Oh, I see. I've got a screw loose, apparently. <laughs> Yeah, that ain't gonna work. All right. Does anybody have an eye patch? <clears throat> no? All right. I'm gonna try to go without being able to read. You already knew I had a screw loose, didn't you? What's that? Blind in one eye, can't see out the other. <laughs> All right, so historical reality is the claim. Our fellowship is based on, you know, what people have always done. You can see that they just agreed to disagree. That's how they achieved unity. Unity cannot be achieved by uh, attaining to the standard of the Bible. These are the things that they say. 
He also says Christians in New Testament times, as Christians today, lived with conscientious disagreements. To acknowledge this fact is simply to face the truth. To deny it is to make ourselves an object of ridicule. Yeah, you are ridiculous if you think that people can understand the Bible alike. That's the assertion. You can see that people are not agreeing, that they live with conscientious disagreements. It's just facing the truth. Like you are refusing to admit that this is what's really happening. That you're holding on to some fantasy in which there is unity in Christ and in his teaching. But no, that's not the case. Any more than it was true when Korah said it, it's not true when Ed Harrell says it either. You've killed the people of the Lord, it says. Remember after this, when the Lord opened the ground and swallowed Korah and those that followed him, the next day, number 1641, all the congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. Well, no, Moses and Aaron didn't do anything. God opened the ground. And no, they weren't the people of the Lord. That's why the ground opened and swallowed them up. Not because they were the Lord's people, but because they were not the Lord's people. And they were in the midst of the Lord's congregation. And the Lord destroyed them from the midst of the congregation. That should have been fairly plain and clear, as we discussed in an earlier lesson. But in the historical writings here of the Bounds of Christian Unity, he said there were lonely voices in the 30s who questioned the scriptural basis for church-supported institutions. These men developed anti-institutional doctrinal arguments as fully as the debaters of the 50s and 60s did. In spite of their convictions, these conservative men never hinted institutional supporters were false teachers, or indeed that they were unworthy of fellowship. Brethren continued to work and worship together in spite of their differences. So what's your problem? You factious person with your doubtful disputations insisting upon your interpretation of the Bible. See? That's what he's getting at. What do you think? Is there a scriptural basis for church-supported institutions? Should we have an orphan's home, an old folks' home, a school, a college? Should the church support these things? No, there's no Bible for any of that. The fact that these who brought it up long before didn't say that the others were teaching error, didn't consider them unworthy of fellowship, continued to work and worship together alongside each other despite the fact that some were doing this thing that was not right. That doesn't make it so. That doesn't make it good or right or true. That has no bearing on what you and I are supposed to do about it. But this idea, you killed the Lord's people. No, that's not the Lord's people. They weren't doing what God said. Now somebody will say, well, that's where you came from. No, it's not. <laughs> I came from down the street, you know. The fact is that the history books are full of the things that can be recorded and the things that can be captured and seen. And the people of God are not those things. Because the people of God are not leaving tracks. They're not leaving architecture and artifacts. The people of Israel took a land that didn't belong to them. They dwelt in cities and houses they didn't build, cisterns they didn't dig, fields they didn't plant. And they were forbidden from having idols. Anybody who was an Israelite in ancient Israel who was a faithful child of God left not a trace of physical evidence. You understand? And Christians today are the same way. If you are a faithful child of God, a generation from now there will be no evidence that you were here. Maybe the writings, if they survive, or the YouTube, if it's still around, I kind of hope not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know but there's not going to be a trace there's not going to be architecture 
artifacts, right? Finally, everyone who comes near shall die. This is what they said in number 17 after God showed them that, yes, it is Aaron, and only Aaron. The people said to Moses, 12 and 13, Behold, we perish. We are undone. We are all undone. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Are we all to perish? So everybody who wants to be right dies? There's no way to be right with God? There's no way to survive, to be saved? Uh, that's not true. But that's what they think. It can't be done. It's impossible. Nobody can please God. We can't make it. And to read the same accusation by Ed Harrell, he said, Critics of the plea to restore New Testament Christianity have often pointed to substantial differences as proof that the plea is flawed. For instance, they point to historic disagreements on women covering their heads, whether military service is the equivalent of murder, and to the variety of views held on divorce. Interesting. Covering your head because you respect your husband and your God and want to show honor and humility and submission. Adultery. <laughs> Are those equivalent in any way? I don't see the equivalency here, do you? How are those the same? Yeah, I don't see it. Many, despairing of ever resolving these and other issues, have abandoned the quest for New Testament Christianity. And every time I read about the quest or the search, I think about Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Because when they were asked, what is your quest? The answer is to seek the Grail. Not to find the Grail, to seek the Grail, right? And that's the point. It's meant to be funny. But brethren, talk about it like it is the goal. They view the great schisms that have occurred in the movement over missionary societies, instrumental music, institutionalism, institutionalism even, as arbitrary and inconsistent with continued debate on a wide range of biblical issues. Some would argue all of, our, all of our associations should be governed by a simple measure of right and wrong. One who misinterprets the scriptures as a sinner and should be marked as a false teacher. Actually, I don't know anybody who says that. But no one lives by such a neat formula. It's impossible to find two Christians who agree about the meaning of all biblical instructions. That's interesting. I don't even know what he means when he says the meaning of all biblical instructions. He's a lot less clear than the Bible is, I find, for what it's worth. But we'll come back to this. People are despairing of ever resolving these issues. Which issues? The question. The variety of views held on divorce, for example. Just so that you don't forget, we're talking about Homer Haley and the error that he teaches, right? That's why he's doing that. Well... People are despairing of ever resolving it, not because it cannot be known, not because the Bible hasn't legislated on this matter, but because brethren refuse to obey God. That's why. Don't despair that God cannot be known, that God cannot be served, that anyone who comes near must die. No, that's not true. You, I can see if you despaired over the church ever repenting, but... I wouldn't even do that. There's some good in them. Look at the issues that he thinks people see as arbitrary. Missionary societies, instrumental music, institutionalism. Are these arbitrary? As in, you just picked these issues out of a, a slew of problems. You could have made bones about any of them, but these are the ones you decided to camp on. See, that's what he's saying. He would say that there are many dis disagreements. There are so many they can't be counted. But we camped on these. That's not true. 
They view it as arbitrary and inconsistent with continued debate. Again, the idea is that it's always this quest for truth, the search for truth, not that you've actually found it. Remember, Jesus said, seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened. The goal is not to knock. The goal is to get the door opened. And the goal is not to seek. The goal is to find. Some would say you should be governed by a simple measure of right and wrong. He won't accept that the Bible has a simple measure of right and wrong, clean and unclean. The priests are making distinctions, who by reason of exercise have their senses trained to discern good and evil. That's what's supposed to happen. Yes. No one lives by such a neat formula. Speak for yourself. Yeah, speak for yourself. Just because you look around and you don't see the church is doing it, that doesn't mean that God's wrong. That doesn't mean that God's word is not true. And that doesn't mean that there isn't somebody who's doing it. There are churches that are faithful. Impossible to find two who agree about the meaning of all biblical instruction. That's not true either. Um, I'm not sure what he means by the meaning of all biblical instructions. That's very nebulous and allows him to argue that, no, there is nobody who agrees on those things. Okay, fair enough. But there are plenty of times when the church is able to assemble and to worship acceptably, to teach the truth. That happens all the time. It's not impossible. It certainly can be done. It is being done. And I'll remind you, this started a long time ago, if you will, um, you know, this Balance of Christian Unity came out and I think it was 89 when it started, maybe 88, but I think it was 89 because it was pretty soon following um, the, you know, I guess it came pretty quickly on the heels of, of Homer Haley going public with his, quote unquote, going public with his doctrine that somehow everybody knew he was teaching for many years prior to that, but it wasn't public. I don't know if I understand that either, but this series came out at that time. And when he did this, he acted, that is when it heralded this, he did, he acted just like Balaam. You may recall that Balaam was not able to curse the children of God. He couldn't bring them down directly, but he was able to tell Barak, uh, Balak, the, the king, Moab, how to bring Israel down. He gave him a formula. Get them to marry your daughters. Invite them to your sacrifices. And when they are unfaithful to the Lord, the Lord himself will strike them. And that is exactly what happened. That's the incident of Baal Peor. And Harold did this. He taught how to place a stumbling block because he gave this uh, series of articles with all these arguments about why you can't understand it, how people have always not understood it and just been fine with it, and that the real problem is those who insist that there is absolute truth. Homer Haley definitely taught error, and it's even documented in his book. But it was 1988. And Harold's first article was Homer Haley, false teacher, question mark, and the answer is no. <laughs> he says no, not a false teacher, he's a good and sincere man. I don't know, he probably was sincere, I don't know, but I know that what he said is not true, because that's not what the Bible said. I got no beef with the guy, I don't know him, I don't care, in terms of personal things, but I know that when he said divorces prior to baptism don't count, he was wrong. John lost his head for that. And then Ed said, fellowship should continue with Homer Haley despite the error that he was actively teaching. In that article, Homer Haley, false teacher, and then the bounds of Christian unity followed immediately on the heels of that. All the quotations that I've shown you today are from this matter. They're in connection with this doctrine from Homer Haley. And this is where he showed or used Romans 14 as the manual for how you set up the boundaries of fellowship, how you agree to disagree and continue to 
go along despite doctrinal differences. This is the thing that happened. And that's what we're taking apart here so that you can see it for what it really is and you can recognize it when you see it in the wild because I tell you, it is de facto the rule for the churches. That's just the way that things are these days. This has gained the majority. This has gained the, um, I guess, the influence. Almost every non-institutional church is following this pattern instead of the biblical pattern. But I do want you to be able to take that apart and to see it for yourself. Realize how that, yeah, somebody, somebody else in the Bible said these things before, and it didn't go well for them. They were wrong about this. Um, so I'm going to stop there, which is already too far, but it was I had to put them all together. Sorry. Um, in the next opportunity, the Lord willing, we will have uh, further discussion about why isn't this a land flowing with milk and honey? <laughs> How did we get here? How come they're not in a land flowing with milk and honey? I think that's an important matter. But today, the most important matter is, are you right with God? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? If you pass away somehow, will you find yourself greeted by the Lord, happy in uh, the afterlife, or will you be lost having known what was right but not done it. Um, as we said before, I, I wouldn't uh, despair of brethren doing the right thing. I think they can. There's good in them. There's reason why they uh, are standing where they do stand, and we would need to figure out what that is and try to reach them somehow. But today, if you are not a Christian, you've got to start by becoming a Christian. That's how you get forgiveness. That's how you get the help of God on your behalf, the mediation of Jesus. If we can help you to obey the gospel of Jesus, we will help you by uh, helping you to be baptized in the name of Christ, being dunked in water for forgiveness of sins. If you are today a Christian already who has been baptized in his name but have not kept your vow, you've not been faithful to him, let us pray that you can be restored to him based on your repentance. If you need today our prayers, or if you need today uh, to obey the gospel, do not delay. It is the most important thing. Let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.